I want to first of all thank Luis for that very kind introduction and to say a very special thanks to uh, Fabio Bertato, to uh, Professor Carnielli, and to everyone at the uh, Center here for Logic, Epistemology, and History of Science for all the work they've done to make this meeting possible and to bring all of us here for what I know is going to be a very interesting uh, three days. I also want to say something very briefly about why I feel a very uh, special connection to Brazil. And why is this not going? I feel a very special connection to Brazil it goes back to a book I wrote a number of years ago about Abraham Robinson because he too had a very special connection to Latin America and when he met Rolando Chuaque at um, UCLA during the logic year there in 1967 they agreed to try and stimulate mathematical logic in Latin America and they put together the first uh, Slough meeting of one uh, this was the uh, first uh, symposium in Latin America on mathematical logic was held at the University of Santiago in 1970. And in 1972, the second one was actually held as Robinson was finishing his first term as president of the Association for Symbolic Logic here in Brasilia. The first meeting, only three countries in Latin America were represented. But by the time the third slalom meeting occurred in 1984 in Sao Paulo, 58 participants from Latin America really reflect the extraordinary interest that began there and has continued to develop in mathematical logic uh, here in Brazil and Latin America generally ever since. So I'm particularly grateful to have been invited, uh, thanks to the connection I felt uh, through Abraham Robinson, to Brazil, my first trip here, and to say that I'm really uh, very pleased uh, to have been asked to participate in this first uh, CLE a colloquium for philosophy and uh, history of the formal sciences are devoted to uncertainty and inexactness. And this is a topic that I'm going to approach uh, in terms of uncertainty and inexactness in set theory, Georg Cantor, and the discovery of the paradoxes of set theory. In particular, what I want to address this morning are the reasons why Georg Cantor was never, uh, apparently, troubled by the paradoxes uh, the collection of all transfinite cardinal or ordinal numbers. Uh, he didn't seem uh, at all concerned about the uh, possible paradoxical nature of these concepts for transfinite set theory. And I want to argue why instead he took the paradoxes to be both natural and necessary consequences of his development of transfinite set theory. Now the substance of Cantor's revolutionary mathematics of the infinite is well known. In developing what he called the arithmetic of transfinite numbers, he gave mathematical content to the idea of the actual infinite. Now, Cantor's most remarkable achievement was to show in a mathematically rigorous way why the concept of infinity was not an undifferentiated one. Not all infinite sets are the same size, but so shocking and unintuitive were Cantor's ideas at the time that it led the French mathematician Henri Poincaré to condemn Cantor's theory of transfinite sets as a disease from which one day mathematics would be cured. Leopold Kronecker, one of Cantor's teachers and among the most prominent members of the German mathematics establishment, even attacked Cantor personally, calling him a scientific charlatan, a renegade, a corrupter of youth. Well, it's well known that Cantor also suffered throughout his life from a series of nervous breakdowns which became increasingly apparent, uh, apparent and debilitating as he got older. Some have tried to link these, actually, to his dangerous flirtations with the infinite. But in the opinion of Karl Prinitz, one of the psych uh, psychoanalysts and uh, psychologists treating Cantor at the Halle Nerven Clinic, Cantor's illness was really basically endogenous and probably showed some form of manic depression probably had virtually nothing to do with set theory and would have actually occurred no matter what uh, kind of work Cantor had undertaken in his life. 
Nevertheless, it seems to me it was all too easy for the early biographers of Cantor, who, were trying to, who was trying to defend his very complex theory, as the hapless victim of the infinite. Due to his increasingly long periods of nervous breakdowns that began in the 1880s, all of which were exacerbated by the persecutions of his contemporaries. But such accounts, I think, distort the truth by trivializing the genuine intellectual concerns that motivated some of the most thoughtful contemporary oppositions to Cantor's theory. And they also fail, I think, to credit the power and the scope of the defense that Cantor offered for his ideas in the battle to win the acceptance of transfinite set theory. I'm going to dispense with the biographical details related to Cantor's life there, well known to most of you here and easily available. In the interest of time, uh, I'm simply <coughs> going to uh, show you these pictures of his, his uh, parents. If you want to ask questions later, his uh, father's history in particular is quite interesting. Probably of Jewish background from Copenhagen, but he was actually raised an evangelical Lutheran. Cantor's mother was a Roman Catholic, and these all play a part in Cantor's later, as I'm going to explain in a few minutes, theological defense of transfinite set theory. But for now, I want to get to the heart of the mathematical matter of what concerned Cantor, and say that in 1872, uh, Cantor published the first of his papers that reflect an interest in set theory, and this is the paper in which he shows uh, the uniqueness of the representation of arbitrary function by trigonometric series, even if you accept an infinite number of exceptional points uh, related to the uh, continuum of real numbers. Now, in 1872, Cantor was not alone in studying the properties of the continuum of real numbers in rigorous detail. In 1872, the same year as Cantor's paper on trigonometric series, Richard Dedekind also published an analysis of the continuum based on infinite sets. Now, in his monograph, The Subject of Continuity and Inter Irrational Numbers, Dedekind articulated an idea that Cantor later made more precise, namely uh, that the line L is richer in point individuals in the domain R of rational numbers in number individuals. But he really couldn't articulate exactly what this meant. Cantor's major contribution to solving this problem appeared two years later, in 1874, in Prell's uh, Journal for the Pure and uh, Applied Mathematics. What Cantor showed there was the non-denumerability of the real numbers. What Cantor showed was, in fact, a result that is commonplace today, but look at the title of this particular article. It's rather remarkable. It translates as a property of the collection of all real algebraic numbers. Now, why would you give the title to a paper that makes one of the most revolutionary discoveries in uh, mathematics related to set theory, at least, uh, the non-countability of reals? Shouldn't that have been the title of this particular paper? In fact, no one scanning the title of the paper would have guessed that this was the paper that disclosed Cantor's revolutionary discovery of the non-numerability of the continuum of real numbers. This established that, of course, uh, some infinite sets were larger than others, and in fact, R was of greater magnitude than N. I think that the title was deliberately misleading because of Cantor's major critic at the time, Leopold Kronecker. Now, by the early 1870s, Kronecker was already vocal in his opposition to many infinitary arguments, including the bolzano weierstrass theorem, <coughs> upper and lower limits, and irrational numbers. Kronecker's later pronouncements against analysis and set theory, as well as his adamant and well-known insistence upon uh, basing everything upon the integers to provide satisfactory foundations for mathematics, were simply extensions of these earlier ideas. Worse yet, Kronecker was on the editorial board of the journal to which Cantor submitted his paper. Had Cantor been more direct with a title like The Set of Real Numbers is Non-Denumerably Infinite, or A New and Independent Proof of the Existence of Transcendental Numbers, he would have certainly uh, anticipated and expected strong negative reaction from Kronecker. After all, when Friedrich Lindemann had established the transcendence of pi in 1882, uh, Kronecker simply said, what could the value of that result be, uh, since it was clear that those numbers didn't exist? Well, if the idea that Cantor uh, may have harbored fears about Kronecker's opposition uh, to his work at such an early date seems unreasonable, it's worth noting that Kronecker, as early as 1872, had already had a confrontation with Cantor's colleague at Paula, and that was Heinrich Heine, now uh, Edward Heine. And Heine, in Krell's journal, had 
published a paper that Kronecker had literally tried to stop its publication. And Schwartz uh, received a letter from Heine in 1870 about this incident, in which Schwartz, uh, in, in which um, he reported of uh, Heine that his little work uh, on trigonometric series, which I've now had page proofs in hand, which at present is still under debate with Kronecker, who wanted to persuade me to retract it, uh, the particulars below. So it was very clear to Cantor, a colleague of uh, uh, Heine's in uh, Halle, that Kronecker could literally take steps to perhaps try and prevent the publication of Kronecker's paper. Well, having said that, I think there's nevertheless a positive side to the kind of critique that Kronecker represented, because it forced Cantor to evaluate the foundations of set theory as he was pre preparing in the process uh, to create it virtually uh, out of his early work from trigonometric series. And so he takes up the first real defense of transfinite set theory in 1883 in a series of papers that have come to be known as the Grundlagen einer Allgemeinen Manischfaltigkeitslehre. This is a series of papers that uh, he later concentrated uh, into uh, a significant pamphlet. And it's here that Cantor, in fact, issued one of his most famous pronouncements about mathematics, namely that the essence of mathematics was his freedom. Now, this wasn't simply an academic or a philosophical message to his colleagues, because it carried, I think, a secret, hidden, personal subtext as well. It was, as he later admitted to David Hilbert, a plea for objectivity and openness among mathematicians. This, he said, was directly inspired by the oppression, authoritarian, and closed-mindedness that he felt Kronecker represented and worse, had, wieldly, had wielded in a flagrant and damaging way against a number of other mathematicians. Thus, at the very beginning of Cantor's career, and even before he had begun to develop set theory and the more provocative ideas of transfinite numbers, Cantor had experienced the first bitter conflicts with Kronecker, and doubtless he knew he could expect more in the future. Meanwhile, however, Cantor developed uh, a number of, of different ideas, he married uh, Valley Gutmann in the interim, and had begun to work on uh, his major uh, uh, hypothesis, the continuum hypothesis, and here is it's given in an early form, as he uh, put it in uh, 1883, that the power of the uh, real numbers is greater than the power of the natural numbers. We'll get to the algebraic formulation of 1895 in a few minutes. But despite his vigorous efforts to prove uh, the correctness of his continuum hypothesis, he was greatly frustrated in his inability to do so. Early in 1884, he thought he found a proof. But then a few days later, he reversed his opinion. He thought he could actually disprove the hypothesis. And then finally, he realized he made absolutely no progress on this at all, all of which he communicated to his colleague in the talk, Leffler in Sweden. Meanwhile, Kronecker uh, was already beginning to communicate with Mittag Leffler uh, in Sweden as well. And he said that he was determined to show, in fact, a paper he was going to send to Mittag Leffler any day, that the results of modern function theory and set theory are of no real significance. This was not directed just at Georg Cantor, but against uh, Kronecker's colleague in Berlin, Weierstrass, as well. Soon thereafter, in May of 1844, Cantor suffered the first of his serious nervous breakdowns. Although the lack of progress on the continuum hypothesis or stress from Kronecker's attacks may have helped to trigger this breakdown, it seems now clear that, in fact, uh, it had probably uh, nothing more than an underlying cause to do with uh, Cantor's manic depression. When Cantor recovered from this first uh, bout with serious manic depression in June of 1884, uh, he entered the depressive phase of his illness. He complained that he lacked energy. He didn't really want to return to rigorous mathematics. He said he was content uh, simply to take care of trifling administrative matters at the university, but felt capable of very little more. It was also about this time that Cantor began to correspond with Catholic theologians who had taken an interest in the philosophical implications about his theories of the infinite. But I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Cantor made his last major contribution to set theory in 1895 and 1897. He'd already found his famous diagonalization proof for the uh, non-countability non of the real numbers, and eventually he turned this into an algebraic formulation uh, to the ALF null equals ALF1 of the continuum hypothesis. But that 
discovery, uh, eventually in the hands of Bertrand Russell, was used to actually formulate some of the uh, most intriguing paradoxes of set theory, uh, the one that in fact depended upon sets that in fact did not include themselves as members. Russell's paradox uh, suggested there was something fundamentally wrong with Cantor's definition of a set, and that the consequences of this realization immediately became an important problem in 20th century foundations. But even before Russell, it seems that Cantor had already come upon his own version of the paradoxes of set theory in the form of the contradiction that he associated with the idea of a largest ordinal or cardinal number. And he explained all this in a series of letters to Dedekind in 1897, uh, or a statement to Hilbert actually in 97, and then a series of letters <coughs> to Dedekind in 1899. As Cantor wrote to Dedekind, if one considered the collection of all real numbers, uh, transcendental ordinal numbers that is, uh, as the set omega, then this is a system of all numbers, but it's inconsistent, absolutely infinite aggregate, and cannot be considered as a set. It's possible, actually, that Cantor had this idea even earlier, uh, in the 1880s, uh, when he first uh, faced his early uh, difficulties with Kronecker. He was beginning, in fact, in the Grundlagen of 1883, to talk about the possibility of absolute infinite sets. Uh, and he later said that this was actually a reference. The true infinite or absolute, as he said, which is in God, permits no determination. And he associated this as well with his infinite uh, sets or infinite collections of transfinite numbers. Well, whatever the extent of Cantor's awareness of the paradoxes may have been in the 1880s, it was certainly uh, something that made him increasingly sensitive to Kronecker's growing and increasingly vocal opposition. Above all, it was clear that the explicitly philosophical concerns expressed in his Grundlagen were strategically crucial to Cantor in far as his defense of set theory was concerned. This was very unusual at the time. It was not often that a mathematician in the middle of a mathematical paper would start talking about theology and philosophy. And in fact, when Mittag Leffler, one of Cantor's great champions and promoters, published in French so that non-German reading mathematicians could benefit from Cantor's work, what did he do to the Mittagelung? He took out all the philosophy, all of the theology, and simply published the mathematical content. But I believe that the mathematical content, the core of Cantor's theory, was nevertheless, in terms of its philosophical and theological implications, equally as important to Cantor's defense of his set theory. And the reason it's in the Mittagelung Mittalian is because that was his earlier, earliest attempt to try and defend the theory against the kind of opposition that he knew Kronecker represented. However, in order to understand why Cantor was never troubled by the paradoxes of set theory, especially in his later years after publication of the Beiträge of 1895 and 97, his major exposition mathematically of transfinite set theory, there are no metaphysical or philosophical arguments there, except for the aphorisms at the very beginning, but to appreciate the a real defense that Cantor brings to this theory, and why the paradoxes didn't really trouble him, it's important to appreciate the connection that Cantor felt uh, between his mathematics, his philosophy, the metaphysics, and the theological arguments as well. Now, certain documents suggest that uh, in addition to enforcing periodic intervals of contemplation and withdrawal, that is, uh, periods of manic depression uh, incited, uh, Cantor's actual periods of manic depression, the depressive phase at least, were actually quite productive. In fact, he was often able to pursue his mathematical ideas in the solitude of the hospital or quietly at home. This may also have supported his belief that the transfinite numbers had been communicated to him directly from God, and I'll say more about that aspect of Cantor's thinking in a moment. But I think he also embedded this idea in the third of the three mottos that begin at the outset of his last two major publications, the Beiträge. The first one is a famous uh, uh, aphorism from Isaac Newton, Hypotheses Don Fingo, and we can talk about that later if you like. The second is a quotation from Bacon. The third is a quotation from the Bible. And it basically says that the time will come when these things which are now hidden from you will be brought into the light. Well, this is a familiar passage from Corinthians. 
and reflects Cantor's belief that he was an intermediary serving as the means of revelation. It may also be taken to reflect Cantor's faith that despite any prevailing resistance to his work, it would one day, in fact, enjoy recognition and praise from mathematicians everywhere. I'm going to just say something very briefly about some of the things that Cantor actually had to say in defense of his set theory from philosophical and theological positions. In connection with believing that the basic idea of mathematics was its freedom, he wanted by that to stress what he called its imminent as opposed to its transient reality. He made an important argument in the Bible, in the Grundlagen, that in fact, uh, his new transfinite number should really be understood on the same sense as new irrational numbers. That once they were defined as definite, well-defined <coughs> concepts, they had a mathematical existence and deserved to be explored on their own. He also believed that once they were clear and distinct, having uh, come into mathematical existence, they can then be investigated. And this is what he called the imminent nature of the concept of number. Contra went on to say that he understood the basic reasons why Kronecker might have wished to uh, take a different approach to uh, mathematics, but he said he couldn't really accept it because it was way too restrictive. And Contour, in fact, emphasized what he took to be the freedom of mathematics with respect to defining new objects and bringing them into existence. He didn't confine all this, however, just to his uh, close circle of philosophical friends. He also wrote to this in, in very direct terms to mathematicians of broad like Charles Hermite. And in this letter to Charles Hermite, he described a transient reality to the imminent reality that he took to be the essence of his transfinite numbers. Uh, this is the idea that you have the imminent nature of the number, that's what a mathematician is free to explore on his own terms. But Cantor also believed that that imminent reality must necessarily correspond to some reality in the uh, real world. This goes back actually to an idea that Cantor had put forward as early as his Habilitation Schrift in 1869 about the integers and the imminent as well as their transient nature and how these compose a reality uh, similar to those of celestial bodies. Now this also, I think, had a role to play in Contour's argument about the theological and philosophical correctness of the transfinite, because he had a concept that was something like a, uh, a if God could have an idea in his mind, it would somehow be an imperfection not to bring this into reality at some point. So Contour refers to these as possible uh, infinites as opposed to the imminent infinite with which he was uh, primarily concerned. Um, he goes on to say this in terms of the transfinite species are just as much at God's disposals uh, and as his absolute boundless will as are the finite numbers. He talks about this in letters to theologians in particular. One to the Jesuit theologian Ignatius Heiler, Cantor explained that the church should be careful about its stance with respect to the transfinitum and here he saw himself as a kind of uh, 20th century Galileo, uh, hoping to prevent the church from making any blunders theologically with respect to the infinite. He even wrote to Pope Leo XIII about these ideas. And Leo XIII was particularly congenial in some respects to what Cantor had in mind, because in an encyclical, uh, Eternus uh, uh, Patris, of 1879, he talked about a revival, a neo thomist revival in which science and the correct interpretation of scientific ideas needed to go hand in hand. Contour also undertook serious correspondence with a number of Catholic theologians, and among them was Cardinal or was, was uh, Constantine Gouberlet. He actually took up a request of Contours to investigate his transfinitum and declared that in fact uh, the entire uh, collection of numbers must exist without contradiction in the absolute mind of God. And this must have come as certainly reassuring to Cantor. He wrote to another theologian at a great length, Thomas Esser. He was a Dominican in Rome. And he was apparently preparing to investigate the transfinitum to ensure that it didn't conflict with any ideas of the church. And as Cantor later confided into another of his Catholic friends, uh, the Jesuit Ignatius Heiler again, uh, this was exactly the point of what Esser was undertaking in Rome. One cardinal in Germany, Cardinal Franzlin, yep, I'm almost done. Another uh, a German uh, cardinal, uh, Franzlin, uh, in Fulda, 
uh, actually wrote to Codfort to assure him uh, that if properly interpreted, and here's the letter from Cardinal Franzlin to Codfort, that if properly interpreted, his transfinitum was not uh, really endangering uh, God or religious ideas in any way. By now, I hope it's clear that Cantor's strongest reasons for not fearing the paradoxes of set theory were oddly theological. As he wrote to Ignatius Heiler, I entertain no doubts about the truth of the transfinites, which I have recognized with God's help and which, in their diversity, I have studied for more than 20 years every year and almost every day brings me further in this science. He also uh, didn't keep these theological ideas that defended uh, set theory from uh, the larger mathematical public. He writes to his colleague in France, Charles Hermite, as follows. I thank God, the all-wise and all-good, that he always denied me the full million of this wish. He'd always want to go to Göttingen or Berlin. Said he was in Halle for virtually all of his career. But this made him, in essence, uh, take a deeper interest in theology. And he says, this made it possible for me to uh, support uh, God and the uh, Catholic Church better than if he had simply done his work as a mathematician. He explained that, uh, even more bluntly, in a letter to Thomas Esser in 1894, for me, Christian philosophy will be offered, for the first time, the true theory of the infinite. Well, as Contra said at the very beginning of his Beitrega, remember that third of the aphorisms, the time will come when these things will be brought into the light? Well, that's exactly what Contour saw himself doing as a kind of messenger. Years earlier, he had actually uh, confided in his father that he had been drawn to mathematics by a secret inner voice, and that whatever a secret voice calls you to, you will surely carry through to success. Well, there was also a technical reason, I believe, in addition to the theological, metaphysical, and theological reasons that supported Cantor's faith in the correctness and uh, propriety of his transfinite set theory. In the version that uh, he presented his transfinite numbers in terms of the paradoxes and the collection of all transfinite numbers as not being a set. Prior to the Grundlagen in 1883, Cantor's transfinite set theory, if you can call it that, before 1883, depended upon the indexes of infinite point sets, the derived sets that he had used to get his very interesting 1872 theorem on the uniqueness of representation of arbitrary functions by trigonometric series to work. If those were just symbols identifying point sets, in the Grundlagen, he goes on to translate now the transfinite numbers and actually define them on their own terms, in terms of sets of numbers. If the class of all numbers were a set, then it would have to have a successor. And this is where Cantor, in his note 2 to the conclusion in the Grundlagen, does not refer to any contradiction as his reason for saying that the entire set of numbers cannot be a set. This is what Cantor says. The absolute, there's that word again, can only be acknowledged but never be known, and not even approximately so. So every superfinite number, however great, of any of the higher number classes is followed by an aggregate of number and number classes whose power is not in the slightest reduced compared to their entirely, absolutely uh, infinite aggregate of numbers starting with one. But the absolute for Cantor, as we've seen, was not simply a mathematical absolute. In 1908, Cantor explained to the British uh, mathematician Grace Chisholm Young, a peculiar fate which, thank goodness, has in no way broken me, but in fact has made me stronger inwardly, has kept me far from home. He was in the Holland Nervin Clinique after one of his uh, manic depressive breakdowns. In my lengthy isolation, neither mathematics nor in particular the theory of transfinite numbers has slept or lain fallow in me. Thus, even when he was institutionalized in the mental hospital, suffering from manic depression, he was never alone. His mathematics and his transfinite numbers were always there. Now, it's very easy, I think, to misunderstand Cantor's mental breakdowns and the strongly religious element in his thinking, as popularizers often do. This was certainly the case in an article that appeared in 1977 in the French magazine La Recherche, which used the following caricatures to illustrate an article about Cantor, his religious convictions, psychological illness, and the transfinite set theory. 
This picture shows Cantor, uh, presumably in ecstasy, receiving a divine message. Well, the second picture shows Kronecker, the one holding the gun, <laughs> um, and literally uh, shooting at Cantor. Well, Cantor is teetering on the balance, but what's keeping him in balance? God on the other end of the uh, balance, while Cantor is in the midst of uh, balancing on the perch, the edge of a transforming alif. Well, I want to conclude my remarks this morning about the uncertainty and the inexactness that many associated with the discovery of the paradoxes of set theory with a remark of Cantor's that I believe makes as clear as he possibly could why the paradoxes never troubled him. My theory, he said, in a letter to Haman of June 1888, stands as firm as a rock. Every arrow directed against it will return quickly to its archer. How do I know this? Because I've studied it from all sides for many years. Because I've examined all objections that have ever been made against the infinite numbers. And above all, because I have followed its roots, so to speak, to the first infallible cause of all created things. Well, <coughs> later generations might dismiss the philosophy, look askance at Cantor's abundant references to St. Thomas or the Church Fathers, overlook his metaphysical pronouncements, and miss entirely the deeply religious roots of Cantor's later faith and the absolute truth of his theory. But all of these commitments contributed to his resolve, I believe, not to abandon transfinite numbers, Opposition seems to have strengthened his determination. His forbearance, as much as anything else Cantor gave, might ensure that transfinite set theory would survive in the years of doubt and denunciation to flourish eventually as a vigorous revolutionary theory in 20th century mathematics. Thank you.